Welcome to Hope Woken Grace. We are officially in December and we're ready to celebrate Christmas. As we come into today at the beginning of the Christmas season, we're going to be singing some songs about Jesus being born, coming as a baby to be in flesh with us. But he didn't stay as a baby. We don't just celebrate him as baby Jesus. We celebrate him as our savior, as our deliverer, as the king of kings who's come in power and majesty. So let's think about that as we sing these words of who he is. So let's celebrate him in joy this morning. Would you stand and sing with us?
God, we celebrate you as the King of Kings, Lord over all. Help us to see you in that way and to know you in that way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before we get started, why don't you go ahead and say hello to someone near you? Wonderful. You may have a seat. Well, welcome to Hoboken Grace. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Cindy, and we're just so excited to see everyone here this morning. Um, we have tables set up in the back, so we just hope at any point you find something to eat or drink and then make your way back and just make yourself feel right at home. Everything that we do throughout the week, and especially on Sunday mornings, is all with this prayer that people find their way back to God. And this morning, I just feel an overwhelming um, gratefulness to know that all are welcome, not only in our space here, but in God's presence, and that we can just come as we are today, no more and no less. Wherever we find ourselves in life, it doesn't matter where we've been or what we've done or where we're going. We know that God is pursuing us and that we are welcome 
to be here in his presence and to get to know him. And if there's any doubt that God is pursuing you, we don't have to look any further than the cross. Scripture tells us that we had separated ourselves from God, but that he was not okay with that. And he sent Jesus Christ to this earth, to the cross, to die a sinner's death so that we could be part of his family once and for all. And so each week we have um, tables set up throughout the room behind the pillars where we offer the Lord's Supper, which is bread and juice. And we just invite you at any point throughout our throughout the rest of our time together to feel free to stand up and make your way back to those tables where you can have a moment to celebrate and remember how far God has gone to pursue each and every one of you. And it is because of what he did on that cross and, that, and through his resurrection that we are able to sit here and have a direct and personal conversation with God. And so that's what we're going to do right now is I'm going to um, start us off in prayer and I'm going to give us a chance, give you a chance right where you are to just sit and have a conversation with God. And if you've never done this before, it really is as easy and as comfortable as talking to a friend. And just, I just, my prayer this morning is just that we just have this heart of gratitude that we are accepted as we are today and that we can sit here and just be loved by and be known by God. And so, will you pray with me? Father, I just thank you for your mercy that is new every morning, for your grace and your kindness and your compassion towards each, each and every one of us. I just thank you for an opportunity to, to get to know you today and for this moment right now where we just get to share our hearts, whatever is going on, Father, that we know that we can come to you without shame and without guilt, um, that, you, that you want to know us and that you want to, to hear from us so that you can share your overwhelming love in our lives. And so, Father, we pray. Father, thank you for hearing us. Thank you for pursuing us. It's in your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I felt that my birth entitled me to freedom the freedom to breathe fresh air, to gaze upon the sun and let it kiss my skin glowing with radiance, to sleep underneath the smiling moon and just be a fragment of hope among the stars, to be born into a world of such mayhem, chaos, and cruelty topped with elegance. We are lucky. We are constantly cloaked in your love, your undeserving children who turn their back on you and refuse to say, I love you too. Yet we swim in your waters, enjoy your rainbows, and run our fingers through your leaves, but do we deserve it? How easily does memory slip through our fingers? 
I remember indulgence, unwrapping each confection, trying to satisfy hunger but never being filled. I was hungry, always hungry to cover pain, hungry to look like someone else, hungry to be someone else, hungry to overindulge in everything. I was hungry for contentment, but not in the contentment in the beauty that has been created. Do I deserve it? See, my gluttony has caused me to overlook mountainous beauty, multi-vocal harmony, singing praises, a treasure chest of wonder that has been created, my kin and acquaintances that I tend to overlook because I was hungry for more, the desire for more. Wake up. The more is all around us. Through his stripes of pain, we get to experience unconditional, unfailing, undying love. Through his spilled blood, we get to be reunited with those who have only become a page in memory. We get to indulge in the endless wedding reception. We have acquired a ransom that has been signed, sealed, and delivered in his brokenness scars and bruises that run so deep. He has made it possible for us to overindulge in his true love. It is a thirst that is quenched. It is a need satisfied. It is a desire fulfilled. I've learned to hunger for celebrating, hunger to love better, hunger to experience his love. And that is all I am hungry for. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, you guys doing all right? Okay, so you're not. It's been a rough morning. That's okay. Uh, yeah, as Kelvin says, early, 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 early. Well, well, good morning and welcome. For those of you who are with us for the first time, my name is Chris. I'm the lead pastor here at Hoboken Grace. And today we are wrapping up a conversation called Drained. And we've been working through for the past couple of weeks this reality in our lives that we have almost an unparalleled ability to be able to drain just the joy out of just about everything that we have, out of just about everything that we've been given. And we have this ability to take the good things in our lives, and because of the way that we compare to the world around us and because of the lies that we believe, we have the ability to, to drain the, the life out of them. And rather than being able to enjoy them, rather than being able to, to, to experience them, we're constantly moving on to the next thing. We, we live in this state, this constant state for many of us of discontentment. But yet a couple weeks ago, we looked at this, this incredible dream that God brings to us. And you see it in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. As Paul is talking about his own life, and he says this. He says, not that I was ever in need. He says, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. Paul says, I, I've left behind that world. I've left behind that story of discontentment, that story of, uh, of constantly moving on to the next thing and, and constantly looking at what I don't have as opposed to enjoying what I do have. He says, I've left that behind, and I've actually learned, I, I, I'm, I'm experiencing, I'm living in the reality of contentment. And so for the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at, okay, how do, how do we do that? What, what does that look like in your life and in my life? How, how do we live that. And again, I can't emphasize this enough. I can't emphasize this. This is about so much more than just how we feel about our stuff. This is about so much more than, than just how we feel about what we have. Because discontentment is at the heart, is, is at the heart of those decisions that we make that lead us away from God. Discontentment is at the heart of the lie that God doesn't care about you, that God hasn't provided for you, that, that, that you can't trust him. At, at, the, at the core of that is the lie of discontentment. It's been the lie from the very beginning that God is not all that you need, that God hasn't given you what you need, and therefore you need to pursue it outside of him. This is about so much more than just how we feel about our stuff. 
or what we have. This is the core of our ability to be able to follow Christ. At the core of our ability to be able to worship and honor him with our lives. And so we've, we, we've begun to dive into this and look at, okay, how, how, do, we, how do we do that? What, is, what does that look like for me? What does that look like for you? We began to break that down and we, and we looked at how when you, look, when, when you see Paul's life, you don't see someone who stops comparing, but he actually he lives in a constant state of comparison to what it is that he deserves and this reality that whether he has a lot or whether he has a little, he has more than what he deserves because what he deserved was to die. And then last week we built on that and we, and we talked about how that, that perspective can be so fleeting in our lives. And so there are these, these disciplined practices that God calls us into. And, and I just remind you again, because one of them that we talked about last week was communion and just how communion is this constant reminder. And Cindy talked to you about it, and some of you are like, oh, yeah, I, I do that sometimes. I just remind you again to make it a weekly practice because it's, it's, it's a constant reminder of what it is that we deserve and what it is that we've been given. This unbelievable reality of how God has loved us and with undeserved kindness has brought us back to life. And we've been looking at and breaking down, okay, what does this look like in Paul's life? And what did Paul practice? And, and how, how did he live this out? And, and up to now, everything that we've been talking about has really been proactive. And looking at, okay, how do we engage this? Not, rather than waiting for discontentment to come to us, how do we engage this? How do we actually begin to, to transform our minds and change the way that we think about this and change the way that we, that we intellectually interact with and engage this on a day-to-day basis? But today I want to shift that a little bit. And as we, as we, as we close this series, I want to take a second to talk about the reactive side. Yeah, and so far, everything's been proactive, but I think that it's, it's necessary for us to talk about the reactive side as well. Because even if you go into this, even if you go into this and you're practicing these things and, and you're working at transforming your mind and, and constantly looking at, okay, what, is, what do I deserve and what has God given me? What do I deserve and what has God given me? E- even, if you, even if you're really, really good at that, at some point, at some point, discontentment is going to rear its ugly head. At some point, it's going to show up. And, and you're going to be enjoying life and living life as, as normal and, and thinking, man, I'm, this, is, this is great, and, and, and experiencing that contentment, and then all of a sudden, you're going to get that call, and your friend got engaged, and you just, like, you're like, I'm so happy for you. And you hang up and throw the phone across the room, some of you know what I'm talking about. You're, you're like, I can't laugh because then they'll know that I did that once. But, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. Or, or you, you get that call from your friend, right? And, and oh, we're, we're expecting a baby. And you're like, I'm so happy for you. But, but you're not. And there, all this, this discontentment, it just begins to rear its ugly head. And you don't want it to. And everything inside of you hopes that it goes away. Everything inside of you says, I I shouldn't feel this. I don't want to feel this. I mean, look at, uh, and you're trying to remind yourself, okay, what is it that I deserve? And what has God given me? And and you're telling yourself this over and over again, but that discontentment's still there. And and one of my fears is that as we we walk through this and, and, and coming out of this, one of my fears is that in that moment that we'll get really, really frustrated in that moment that we'll give up on the dream that we could ever actually live the life that Paul says that he lived, that we could actually live in contentment. And, and, and more importantly, that we'll miss out, that we'll miss out on these, these key opportunities in our life. And, and, and I mean that. These moments, these moments are key opportunities in our lives. When discontentment shows up in your life, my, my fear is that many of us are going to look at it and be frustrated. Oh, why is this happening? Why am I f-? As opposed to being able to look at it and, and, and rather than becoming frustrated about the fact that it's shown up, to be able to interact with it and say, wait, 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 this is an opportunity for me to do something 
to do something that the scriptures call us to do over and over again. Paul, as he's talking to the Corinthians, he talks to them about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. And he says this. He says, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. And he's talking to them about their relationship with Christ. But all throughout Paul's life, one of the things that you see about Paul is that Paul is incredibly self-aware. And Paul's constantly taking time to examine himself. He talks to the Corinthians as well about this when he talks to them about communion and talk about examining themselves before they go. He's constantly calling people to examine themselves and say, what's actually happening inside of you? What's actually going on inside your heart? Not, Not just what are you doing on the outside, but what's happening inside of here? And when you hear Paul talk, Even when he talks about himself, he talks about himself in a way that is incredibly self-aware. So you hear him talk at one point about the battle within himself. He says, I want want to do this, but but there's something inside of me that's pulling me this other direction. And and, and he's giving words to something that many of us have experienced. But but Paul's taken the time to to be incredibly self-aware, to pay attention. Rather than just becoming frustrated with the moment, rather than just moving past the moment, he, he pays attention to the moment. And says, okay, wait, 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 what's actually happening here? What's actually happening in my life right now? What's happening in my heart? And these moments, these moments where discontentment begins to rear its ugly head are incredible opportunities for you to be able to see, okay, what's actually happening in my heart? And as we talk through this, I think, I think it's very important that not only are we proactive in the way that we're transforming our minds, but that we learn how to react to discontentment well so that we don't miss the opportunity, so that we don't miss what, what this moment and these moments have the opportunity to reveal to us about ourselves. See, I, I, I think that as we, walk, as we walk through this, it's crucial for us that when we experience discontent, discontentment, that we inspect it. That we inspect it. That we look at our lives, and, and, we, and, and there are probably a lot of different things that factor into this, but there's a few crucial questions that I want to give to you today that, 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 that I want to, to challenge you to walk through, that I see Paul calling us to walk through, or things that he, he's inspecting in his life as he's experiencing these different things, and, and that I want to call you to be able to walk through yourself as you experience that discontentment, because th- th- these things are kind of at the core of what usually drives discontentment in your life and my life. And so when discontentment shows up, the first question that I think that we have to ask ourselves, the first question that that we have to ask ourselves is this. Is there a lie that I'm believing here? Is there a lie that I'm believing here? And this, this this can impact the conversation in all sorts of different ways. It can show up in all sorts of different ways. It can be about something really big in our life, or it can be about something really small in our life. And there's all sorts of lies that begin to creep into our lives about what we need and what we don't need. And, and, and some of them are really, really big, and some of them are, are really, really small, but they impact our lives nonetheless. I remember when Anna and I first had kids, and we began to work through the process of registering for our child, our first child. If you haven't had the experience of doing that yet, just prepare for one of the biggest fights in your marriage that you've ever experienced. Because it's, it's incredibly stressful. Some of you have registered for a marriage and you thought that that was a fight. Just wait. It, it gets worse, okay? And, and I remember walking through that and, and we were talking about these things. And, and, and we began to see in each other's lives all these lies that we believed about what you needed in order to be able to survive as a baby. And, and I, I actually appreciate it. About that time, there was a documentary that was released called Babies. Have you guys ever seen that? 
right? It, it's actually a pretty cool documentary. It follows these kids who grew up in four very different places. And so one of them's in New York and has like a full-time nurse and a full-time nanny and, and, and basically lives in a little bubble in Manhattan that nothing can ever get to it or touch it. And the other one is in Africa. And the mom like leaves the child in the hut for hours at a time to be able to go do what she has to do in order to be able to survive. And and it was interesting because as, as we're interacting with this, one of the things that I kept telling Anna is, listen, if you lived in Africa, you wouldn't have that. And she hated me saying that. I mean, she hated me saying that. But it, it, it's crazy, these lies that come in about what we need or what we don't need. And again, we laugh about these things, but listen, listen, listen. These things are at the core of whether or not you believe that God's actually provided for you. They are. And when you buy into those little lies that I don't have what we need and we don't, and we need this, we need that, and it, it, it begins to erode your sense of the fact that you're loved by the one who's loved you most. And so when, when you begin to feel that discontentment, one of the first things that you need to ask is, is there a lie that I'm believing here about what it is that I need? Like, do, do I really need this? Or is this just a want in my life? It, it can show up in more profound ways. It's, it's interesting how this shows up on our spiritual journey because sometimes where we experience discontentment is actually in our pursuit of Christ. And all of a sudden, we'll become discontent with where we are, and I want to be where they are, and I want to experience God the way that they experience God, and why, don't I exp why, why doesn't God interact with me the way that God interacts with them? And we begin to feel this discontentment, and there's this lie, there's this lie inside of us uh, of what it is that God's love is based on. And we begin to believe that God's love is based on where we are in our spiritual maturity and our growth or our relationship with him. It, it's a lie. And to be able to ask ourselves, okay, is there a lie that I'm believing here? And this is important, not just so that you identify the lie. Identifying the lie is crucial. Because then you can confront it with truth. As a matter of fact, I mean, you see it all throughout the New Testament, but there's a passage in Ephesians chapter 4 where it says this, it says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. And usually when people talk about, when people talk about this passage, they usually, they usually talk about it in terms of, okay, don't be dishonest or don't lie to the other person. But the word that he uses here is actually much bigger than that. He's, he's talking about truth in general. He's not talking about don't lie to each other. It's, it's bigger than that. He said, no, no, you need to make sure that you're speaking truth into one another's lives. D don't, don't fuel the lies in each other's lives. You need to get rid of that falsehood. And in those moments where, where you begin to experience discontentment, that it's a key opportunity for you to be able to see the lies that have worked their way into your life. It's a key opportunity for you to be able to identify them. And then not just to identify them, but then to begin to fight them, to replace them with truth. You're beginning to believe the lie that God's love for you is based on your performance. So you begin to, to, to search out and, and find Bible verses and passages that you can confront that with, that, that, you, can, that you can begin to memorize and, and look at day after day after day that remind you of what is true. Is there a lie that you're believing? The second one is, is kind of the next step in that. And that is this. Is there an idol that you've created? Is there an idol that you've created? Discontentment. Discontentment is the best mirror if you want to be able to see your idols. If you want to see what it is that you think is actually going to bring you joy and peace and security and love, just pay attention to your discontentment. Because your discontentment is going to reveal it every time. 
Because when you feel like you don't have what you need in order to be loved, if you, when you feel like you don't have what you need in order to be valued, when you feel like you don't have what you need in order to be secure, you will not be able to kill the discontentment inside of you. Every time you turn around, it will show up. And it allows you to be able to see those idols that you've begun to build in your life. Those things that you think are going to actually satisfy you. I love the conversation that Jesus has with the woman at the well as it pertains to this in John chapter 4. As Jesus is talking to her, he says, it said, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water, and he's talking about himself. He says, everyone who drinks this water, because they're at the well, he says, we'll be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And Jesus is talking about the idols that exist in this woman's life. Immediately after it, he sends her. He says, he says listen, go get your husband. And she says, I, I, don't, I don't have a husband. He, he says, no, you're right. You don't have a husband. As a matter of fact, there have been five guys that you've been married to, and now the guy that you're living with isn't your husband either. And, and he's addressing these idols in, his, in her life and the reality that she's been pursuing satisfaction and she's been pursuing love. In her relationships with these men. And he says, no, 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 I'm the only one who can satisfy you. When discontentment begins to rear its ugly head, pay attention because it will show you your idols. And I know for some of us, when, when you first hear that, you think, ah, that's not a good thing. That, that, that is an unbelievably good thing for you and for me. Because many of us live our lives pursuing idols and pursuing gods that do not exist and cannot satisfy us, but we're unaware of it. And we haven't taken the time to inspect. We haven't taken the time to examine ourselves to be able to see, okay, what are the actual idols in my life? And the reality that I'm not just pursuing a relationship because I want to be able to love someone well. I'm pursuing a relationship because I believe that it's going to satisfy me. I'm, I'm not just passionate about my marriage because I want to be able to love my wife well or I want to be able to love my husband well. I'm passionate about my marriage because the truth is it's become an idol to me and I think that if my marriage was great then I would be satisfied. Jesus says to the woman at the well, there's only one, there's only one place where you find water that actually satisfies me. Pay attention to where discontentment shows up. It's a valuable tool to allow you to see your idols. To allow you to begin to battle those idols, to be able to say to God, listen, I, I, I need to repent I need to change direction. I, I've, I've been thinking that this was going to satisfy me. I've been thinking. But the truth is only you can satisfy me. Is there a lie that you've been believing? Is there an idol that you've created? And then the third one is interesting. The third one is interesting. It, it's, it may be it may be one of the most pointed out situations or questions in the Old Testament, and that is this. Not only do you have to ask yourself, is there, is there a lie or is there an idol? The next thing that you have to ask yourself is this. Is there a good thing that I've taken from God? Is there a good thing that I've taken from God? In other words, is there something that God has called me to do or to be or, or to see through that rather than following him in, I've decided that I'm going to take it from him and I'm going to make it happen? You see this all throughout the Old Testament. So Sarah and Abraham, God comes to Abraham and Sarah and says, listen, I'm going to make you into this incredible 
incredible nation. And for a while they follow really, really well, but they take that good thing and rather than continuing to follow, they decide we're going to make this happen on our own. And so Sarah says, well, maybe it's not going to actually come from me. Maybe it's going to come from my maid. And so you have a child with my maid, and the the whole thing blows up. You see the same thing with Jacob. In the life of Jacob, you see someone who who God comes in and and gives this incredible dream, this good thing to. Now listen, Jacob, the birthright is going to pass through you. It's It's going to be a really good thing. And Jacob, rather than waiting on God to be able to to put this into practice, rather than waiting on God and how this is going to work out, he takes it. And he decides that he's going to be the one who makes it happen. See it over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament where people take these good things, these things that God wants to see happen, and and, and rather than waiting for God to act, rather than waiting for God to lead, they decide that they're going to lead him. And in the process, the whole thing The whole thing gets screwed up. I experience this all the time. I experience this all the time. As a matter of fact, especially as it pertains to what we do here at Hoboken Grace, because I'll be on this journey, and all of a sudden, this discontentment will begin to show up as far as what's happening at Hoboken Grace and and how people are taking steps and how God's working in our church and all of a sudden, this discontentment will begin to show up. And there are all sorts of lies that are in it. But at the, at the core of it is this, is, is this truth that I've taken a good thing that God wants to do. But rather than waiting on God and, how, okay, God, how are you going to do this? I've decided I'm going to make it happen. And in the process, it leads to all sorts of discontentment. I see this happen in our lives as it pertains to, especially for those of you who are dads as as it pertains to, okay, how are you going to provide for your family? Providing for your family is a good thing. It's a good thing. It's something that God calls us to. But But rather than following him in it, we've just taken it on ourselves, and we're going to make this happen, and we're going to, and in the process, in the process, we've made decisions about what we're going to do with our career and how we're going to handle ourselves professionally that we know God would never ask us to do or call us to do. As a matter of fact, things that we know go actually against what God's called us to do. But we've taken that good thing. Now, I have to provide for my family. We've taken that good thing, and rather than allowing God to be the one who makes it happen, we've decided we're going to be the ones who make it happen. And in the process, it leads to all sorts of discontentment. In the process, it leads us to to make decisions that, rather than drawing us closer to him, they actually take us away from him. And ultimately, ultimately, I think this is, when you look at Paul's life, when you look at Paul's life, Ultimately, this was the question that he was asking every single day. Ultimately, this is the question that he was, that he was working through, I think, every single morning. Listen, listen to what he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. He says, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. He says, What is more, I consider everything a loss con- con- compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. I think every morning Paul woke up and said, It, it, it doesn't matter what comes into my day, it doesn't matter what happens today. I live for, I, I live for one thing. To know him and to honor him. To know him and to honor him. And it doesn't matter whether I'm given much today or whether I'm giving li- given little today. In everything, I want to interact with every single thing in my life based on two things. How can I know him better? And how can I honor him more? He says, everything else, everything else is, is worthless. He says, everything else is just rubbish. There's just, there's just two things. How do I know him? 
And how do I honor him? And when you live with that mission, when you live with that mission, it interacts with those three questions in a really powerful way. Because when you wake up every morning, you say, okay, how, do I, how can I know him and how can I honor him? As, as you experience that discontentment and you look at it and say, man, there's a lie here that, 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 I have to, that I'm believing that, that's, that's destroying my ability to be able to, to honor him with my life then rather than continuing to to live like that lie is true, you begin to actively work against it. For Paul, it was no problem to sacrifice his idols. Why? Because I lived to know him and to honor him. And so as he experienced, as he encountered those idols, he didn't hesitate to sacrifice them. Everything else was worthless compared to knowing him and honoring him. When it came to the things that, the good things that Paul had, that God had called Paul to do, this is, this is one, of the, one of the really unique things about Paul when you, when, when you read through the New Testament. One of the most unique things about Paul is that Paul, through the, through the whole journey, he follows it would have been so easy when God comes to Paul and says, listen, Paul, I'm going, to, I'm going to change the world through you. I'm going to use you. You're going to take the message of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. It could have been so easy for Paul to begin to lead God instead of following God. But he doesn't. He stays there in that place where he's like, no, I'm just going to follow. I'm just, wherever he takes me next, wherever the Spirit tells me to go, whenever he tells me to go, that's where I'm going to go. I'm just going to follow Because for Paul, it wasn't about how he was going to make this good thing happen. Was, I just want to know him and honor him. I just want to know him and honor him with whatever he gives me. With whatever I have, a lot or a little. With whether he gives it to me or whether he takes it away from me, I just want to know him and honor him. As we, as we walk through this, as we walk through this conversation, as we bring it to a close, I, I, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to take at least an hour this week to say, I know it's hard. I know it's Christmas season. And I, even as I prepared for today, I was like, I don't know if I can ask him for an hour because right now an hour of our lives feels like a month. You're like, I, I, I don't know if I could take 15 minutes of my life in this next week because it's so busy and there's so much going on. But listen, listen, listen. This is what Christmas is all about. Just set aside one hour this week to sit down and engage God about this question of contentment. To look at those places where contentment, where discontentment is rearing its ugly head. And to ask yourself, okay, what are the lies that I'm believing here? What are the idols that I've created here? What are the good things that I'm not following God in? I'm I'm trying to lead God in. To engage him in that conversation and to hand him those things. As Paul says, I I pray about everything everything that I worry about, I I give to him. I pray about them. To give those things to him. You say, God, I, I want this thing that I've been making an idol. I just want to honor you in it. I just, I just want to honor you in it. This lie that I'm fighting over here, I just want to know you in it. I want to pursue your truth about it. I, and to engage him in a conversation where you say, whether I have a lot or I have a little, I know what I deserve. I know what I've been given. Whether I have a lot or whether I have a little, what I want more than anything else is to know you and to honor you. To know you and to honor you. And 
and allow him, as you practice the things that we talked about last week, allow him to continue to bring you back to that place day after day after day after day. I just want to know you, honor you. Everything else is worthless. Nothing else matters like that. Go to him this week. Allow him to begin to do what only he can do. And that is this, to give you a heart of contentment. Will you pray with me? Father, We live, we live so much of our lives believing the lies. We live so much of our lives pursuing the idols. We, we, live, we live so much of our lives, rather than following you, trying to lead you and taking the good things that you've called us to and, and beginning to believe that we're the ones who are going to make them happen instead of you. And in the process, we begin to value all these other things over you. Over knowing you and honoring you. Father, I pray that as we come out of this conversation, I pray that we would not... I pray that we would not come out of it and just simply feel better about what we have. I pray that we would come out of it with a commitment and a conviction to use all that we have to know you and to honor you. To use all that we've been given, whether it's much or whether it's little, to know you and to honor you you. Father, I pray that we wouldn't move past those opportunities to see what's happening in our hearts. That we would allow them to be to be moments of clarity for us to see those things that we are that we're holding on to for ourselves instead of using to know and honor you. Father, thank you. Thank you for what you've taught us. Thank you for how you've loved us. May you be honored in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Left my fear by the side of the road. Hear you speak, won't let go to the voice of my Savior once again. Where would my soul be without your Son? Gave his life to save the earth. Rest in the thought that you're watching over me. All I need is you. It's not.
not the same your spirit calls my heart to sing drawn to the voice of my savior once again where would my soul be without your son gave his life to save the earth rest in the thought that you're watching over me all i need is
thank you that all of our life, every single part of our life is held in your hands. Thank you, God, that you satisfy us, Lord, that you've created us to find our joy and our satisfaction in you alone. And I pray that we would leave this place today knowing and believing truth over lies, that we would believe and know who you are in our lives and that you are worth everything. God, help us to give our lives to you constantly, Lord, and pursue you and just to know, Lord, that you're all that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I have no idea. Maybe, maybe both? Check. There, one of these is working. All right, there we go take you out of a somber moment right there, and I'll bring you. I'm Anthony, everybody. Welcome. We're so excited that you are here. A couple of quick things to let you know about before we uh, go on our way today. Number one, when you came in today, you received these bad boys. These are our connection cards. It's the best way to stay connected here at Hoboken Grace. Uh, just go ahead and put whatever information you feel comfortable and drop those off in the orange boxes back there. If you're a member, regular attender, we just want to know that you guys are here so we can continue to be praying for you and, uh, and celebrate you and all of that good stuff as well. So you can drop those off in the orange boxes as well. Uh, if you're a first-time guest, welcome. We really enjoyed having you here today. Uh, hold on to those connection cards. Stop by a connection point. They're marked by the orange signs. We have a free gift we'd love to give to you as well. And speaking of connection, we're in the uh, holiday spirit here at Hoboken Grace. We have a, what we call a connection event tomorrow. It's an opportunity for you to invite your friends to come together. We're doing another Hoboken Grace improv night. Uh, this is to benefit our friends over at True Mentors. However, it's absolutely free. Uh, they will just be taking donations and all that stuff there, but this is an opportunity for you. It's a family-friendly event. Uh, the improv comedians are coming in from the city, from UCB, uh, the Pit, and the National Comedy Theater. You're not going to want to miss this. It's uh, over going to be over at Willie McBride, so invite your friends and family for that. And speaking of Christmas, we got a whole bunch of things going on. We got the Christmas Exchange, which is well underway. Uh, the Christmas Exchange is really, really turning into something very, very special this year. Um, We've been asking for those who are interested in adopting a family uh, to be able to give gifts to those who uh, may need a little extra help this Christmas. Uh, but we also want to open it up to those in our family that. Uh, that may be needing to be on that receiving end. So if you are uh, needing a little extra help this Christmas with your wish lists, I want to encourage you to email christmas at hobokengrace.com, and we'll see if we can take care of those as well. Also, our Christmas Eve services are on the 24th, being it's Christmas Eve, one at 5 o'clock, one at 6.30. This is the best time of year to be able to invite your friends, your neighbors, uh, all of those folks that are special in your life to come and join you on your way out. You'll also receive the invitations that you can hand out to people in your building, uh, your friends, your coworkers. We're also having a special Christmas service here on the 20th that you're not going to want to miss. Last but certainly not least, uh, if you're interested in becoming a member here at Hoboken Grace, we have our uh, membership class called CORE. Today at 2 o'clock, right after 2 o'clock in the study with Pastor Chris. So if you have any questions or anything you want to learn what it means to be a member here at Hoboken Grace, come to CORE. I'm going to pass things back over to Pastor Chris, but we got a whole bunch of things going on. So make sure you invite your friends because next week we got a special holiday concert featuring the kiddos. We'll see you next time, guys. Before we go today, we want to take a second to be able to recognize a couple of our new members here at Hoboken Grace. And, and whenever someone steps into membership here at Hoboken Grace, we give them uh, a little dish towel. And on this dish towel, it says Hoboken Grace, and then it has Philippians 2, 1 through 11 embroidered on it. And, and this is just a reminder to all of us who step into membership that membership here at Hoboken Grace is not about a status, but about service and the reality that we're here to serve the way that Jesus Christ came to serve us. And Philippians 2 talks about how we need to have the same attitude that Christ had. And so this is just a constant reminder to us of our commitment to one another and our commitment to him and his mission. And so this morning, we're going to welcome two of our new members. So would you guys welcome Alice Wen to the stage?
And then would you welcome Al Arthur to the stage. Would you guys pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for Alice and Al. I thank you for how, uh, I thank you for how you're using them. I, I thank you for how they demonstrate service already, how they, they give of their lives for the people around them. I, I just pray that as we continue to move forward on this mission, that, that, they would, that, that they would continue to grow in their understanding of how you've gifted them. I, I pray that they would continue to grow in their understanding of how they fit into your body and, and that, they would, that they would see you use them in really beautiful and powerful ways. Father, thank you for them, and I thank you that we get to be a part of this journey with them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. If you get a chance after the service, seek them out and uh, just introduce yourself if you haven't met them already. And then before we get go, I just want to take a second to remind you to do one other thing, uh, and that is to be able to worship through your giving. One, one of the things that, uh, that we're called to do in the scriptures is to not just worship with the songs that we sing and what, with what we talk about, but to worship with our time, talents, and our treasures, and to worship with our giving. We don't pass baskets here at Hoboken Grace, but you can do that online. Just go to hobokengrace.info and you'll be able to give there. Today on our PushPay app and on our online site, you're gonna see that the Christmas offering has started. And so uh, we've been praying about that for several weeks now as far as how we would be able to give above and beyond what we normally give in recognition of Jesus's birth. And one of the things that we do year after year in our culture to recognize Jesus's birth and to celebrate it is that we give. And we wanna do that as a church as well. And so you'll be able to do that online beginning today if you would like to, but I want to encourage you to worship that way. Now, now if you're here today and your, your friend invited you and you're trying to figure out this whole Jesus thing and whether you can follow him, whether you can trust him, listen, this is not for you. Feel absolutely no obligation to give whatsoever. This is for those of us who stepped into that relationship with him and want to honor him in light of what he's done for us. And so I just remind you to do that. And then may we go out, may we go out and walk into this holiday season, not just celebrating his birth, but may we walk into this holiday season living to know and to honor him. Have a great week, guys. We'll see you next Sunday.